Chapter 5. Mystery at the Mansi. That night a storm flew in from the Atlantic, and when Roy awoke in the morning, the world was soaking wet. As he looked out the window, rain was still falling in torrents. Every now and then a gust of wind lashed it against the window panes. Close by he could hear the thunder of great waves upon the beach. What a day, thought Roy. He had hoped to follow up the clue he had found in the heather the previous afternoon. But this was impossible now. There was nothing to do but stay indoors and wait for the storm to blow itself out. After breakfast, for want of something better to do, he went into the store and looked around at all the miscellaneous things his uncle had for sale. Groceries in one corner, pots, pans, and dishes in another. Brushes, shovels, forks, and other gardening tools in another. Here and there were coils of rope, kegs of nails, pots of paint. It was a general store indeed, intended to supply all the needs of the village. But few were the customers this day. Everybody had the same idea about staying at home till the rain stopped. Now and then, however, some brave soul, dripping wet, hurried in to purchase some much-needed item. Once inside, no one wanted to go out again. The customers merely stood around and talked, hoping the weather would clear up. This gave Roy a chance to ask a few questions he had on his mind. Have you heard of the strange things that have been going on in the village? He asked one old lady, tightly wrapped in a shawl. Oh, Jay, my boy, she said, but I didn't believe a word of it. And I ain't going to believe it till I see somethings or hear somethings myself. But what about Peter MacDonald? asked Roy. What about old Corky and his boat? Nonsense, exclaimed the old lady. Peter MacDonald's dreaming. And as for old Corky, he may have been drinking for all I know. I wouldn't believe either of them. Well, I would, said another old lady who had just come in. I know them well. They're good men. They wouldn't uh, tell a lie, neither of them. I'll tell you something is going on in this village, and I, I'd like to know who is behind it all. Maybe it's angels, and maybe it's not. But something is going on. Angels, said the first old lady. I'll never believe it. Better wait and see, said a weather-beaten fisherman sitting on an apple barrel. Don't you sure be too certain. I've never seen anything like it. Take old Corky's boat, for instance. Who tarred it? Tell me that. And so it went on all the morning and far into the afternoon. Just before closing time, the door burst open and who should be blown in by the wind but the minister from the Mansi? None other than Dr. Samuel McGregor himself. At once, everybody in the store smiled a greeting, for they liked and respected their minister. His coat collar was turned up, and his black ministerial hat was dripping water. And this made it hard for Roy who had never seen him before, to know exactly what he was like. But it was clear that he was tall, middle-aged, with gray hair and a long, serious face, yet not too serious. For there was a twinkle in his eye as he talked with the villagers and told Mr. Wallace what he wanted. Sorry to bother you on a day like this, he said, but the storm has blown down a tree beside the Mansi, and a branch has gone through one of the windows. How big? asked Mr. Wallace. Not very big. It's one of the small panes. 
but the rain is coming in at a great rate and making an awful mess in my living room. Could someone come and fix it tonight? <laughs> Not tonight, said Mr. Wallace, but I'll find you a piece of wood. You can nail over it. I'll have someone up there first thing in the morning to put a new piece of glass. Thank you. Thank you very much, said the minister, accepting the piece of wood. I can nail this on myself, and I'll be expecting someone in the morning. He was about to open the door when Roy stepped up to him. Excuse me, sir, he said, but have you any idea about the strange things that have been happening in the village of late? Ha, 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 laughed Dr. McGregor. Now don't you worry your young head about the, such things. I've heard about them, of course, but how should I know who's responsible? Do you think it's angels? asked one of the old ladies. Now who can tell, said the minister, smiling. Who can tell? I'd like to know. And with this, he opened the door and stepped outside. Just a minute, sir, called the weather-beaten fisherman from his apple barrel. I'd like to ask you a question, if I may. Dr. McGregor came in again and closed the door. What is it, my man, he said. I want to know when you are going to get the bell fixed on the kirk. I like going to meeting to the sound of a bell, and we've nay heard the bell for more than a month now. I want to get it fixed as much as you do, said the minister. Indeed, it would have been mended long ago if I could have found someone to do the job. But nobody seems to know what's the matter. It is stuck, but I'll get going, get it going again some day. Don't worry. Goodbye, all. With this, he was gone, leaving the group in the store to talk about the storm, the church, the bell, and their minister. It was very late that evening before everyone had gone home, and Mr. Wallace was able to lock up his store for the night. By this time, the storm was abating, and in all the cottages of Longview Village, people hoped that this would be a quiet night when good folks could get their rest and sleep. But it was not to be. Early in the morning, before dawn had broken, a bell began to ring. Roy heard it first, and he sat up in bed, wondering what it could mean. Perhaps he was dreaming. But no, the bell still rang. He jumped out of bed and ran to his uncle's room. Mr. Wallace was already up. What is it? asked Roy. It's the bell of the old kirk, said Mr. Wallace. Who can be ringing it at this hour? Let's go and see, cried Roy. All right, said Mr. Wallace as the two threw on their clothes. Evidently, many other villagers had heard the bell, too, for when Roy and his uncle went out on the rain-washed street, it seemed as though everybody was hurrying uphill toward the kirk when the bell stopped. Then the bell stopped. As they reached the gravestones in the yard about the kirk, they caught sight of Dr. McGregor, running toward them from the mansi. What's all this, he cried. Is anything the matter? Who's been ringing the bell? That's what we've come to find out, said Mr. Wallace. Together they went into the old kirk. It was silent as a tomb, and most eerie in the dim morning light. There was nothing to be seen save row on row of empty pews, the old oak pulpit, and the bell rope. All, at, all saw it at once. Pull it, said Dr. McGregor, and see what happens. One of the men stepped forward and pulled the rope. The bell tolled. Incredible, said Dr. McGregor. Who could have mended the bell tonight? And in the dark, too, most extraordinary. 
Nobody had a word to say. This was just too much. All walked in silence back to the Mansi where another shock awaited them. Look, cried Dr. McGregor. Look at my window. Which window? asked Mr. Wallace. That window, said Dr. McGregor, pointing excitedly to a small pane of glass. That's the one that was broken. See, there's a piece of wood I nailed on it only last night, lying on the ground. Mr. Wallace, did you do this? No, indeed I didn't, said Mr. Wallace. I was in bed asleep. So was I, said Roy. Then who did it? I'd like to know, asked Dr. McGregor. Again, there was silence. Maybe it's those angels again, someone said fervently. I'm beginning to wonder myself, said Dr. McGregor. But look over there. Footsteps. Angels don't leave footsteps. Or do they? There were indeed footsteps in the mud. Roy noticed that they led upward toward the mountainside. Yes, and in the general direction of the cave. Eagerly he followed them for some distance, only to discover they disappeared in a pool of water left by the rain.